and we're back for episode 3.1. Our season begins where our last season ended. Sam has seen the White Walkers after the Night's Watch blew the horn three times. Now, as I said last time, John's story is left on a cliffhanger, and we learn that Mance's forces are heading downriver. The story picks up in the Storm of Swords prologue with the Night's Watchman, Chet. Now, back in the first book, John did some conspiring to put Sam in charge of the Ravens, and the two made an enemy of Chet, the previous Raven Tender. The third book begins with the Night's Watch ready to surprise attack Mance's forces at the Fist of the First Men. It's 500 Night's Watch against tens of thousands of wildlings. Chet and many others, though, think this plan is suicide, and so they conspire to kill Mormont, Sam, and several other Night's Watchmen to prevent the attack. Our author then blindsides us with the other attack. Chet and about half of his conspirators die in the attack, and the other conspirators go on to become the mutineers at Craster's Keep. However, one conspirator named Sweet Donald Hill is still alive and is one of John's most trusted men. Anyway, here in the show, it's not obvious, but the Night's Watch actually have a massive battle with the others off screen. This guy loses his head, and everybody else has some blood on their faces. Here, Chet is still alive. So here in the show, Mormont asks Sam if he sent the ravens away, and Sam says he didn't do it. In the book, Sam does in fact get the ravens away, However, he forgets to attach any messages. Nonetheless, he still tells Mormont that he did his job. Elsewhere north of the Wall, John and Egret have found the Wildling host. In the book, John thinks the Wildling defenses are absolutely horrible, so essentially Mormont's surprise attack was not suicide. A Night's Watch attack would have probably destroyed the Wildlings, which means that the other attack on the Night's Watch essentially saved the Wildlings. In our next scene, John meets Mance's lieutenants and mistakes Tormund Giant's Bane for Mance. In the book, it's Magnar of Then, and the Thens are much more integrated with the rest of the Wildlings. One thing that's sadly missing from the show is how playful the Wildlings are. Tormund is a huge joke teller, and Mance loves to tell stories and sing. In fact, when John enters the tent, Mance is singing The Dornishman's Wife. Mance's character strongly parallels Rhaegar, so much so, in fact, that some fans think they're the same person. Mance, like Rhaegar, is a bard ruler who styles himself after Bael the Bard, the bard king of the Wildlings, who kidnapped a daughter of the Stark in Winterfell. Rhaegar, of course, was a bard prince who stole Lyanna Stark, and Mance later sneaks into Winterfell and tries to steal a fake Arya. Mance is a rather intriguing character. He supposedly was a child of a Night's Watchman who spent his entire life at the Wall or north of it. Yet somehow he knows music from down south. He tells John some incredible stories when they meet, including a tale of why he left the Night's Watch, which was supposedly because they didn't want him wearing a cloak with patches of red silk on it. He also tells John that he's seen him twice before when he snuck into Winterfell in disguise. Mance was supposedly at the celebration when King Robert visited Winterfell. So in both book and show, Mance asks John why he wants to join the Wildlings. In the book, John claims it's because he got no respect in Winterfell for being a bastard. It's a pretty lame answer considering the wall is not Winterfell. In the show, John gives a much, much more convincing answer. He claims he lost respect for the Night's Watch because they were okay with Craster's sacrifices. Meanwhile in King's Landing, there hasn't been enough boobs, so we get this extra scene of Bronn with a prostitute and Pod nervously trying to retrieve him. We next get to Tyrion, who's in his room, paranoid that his sister is going to kill him. He fully believes that Mandon Moore was sent by Cersei, when in fact he was probably sent by Littlefinger. Now in the book, Tyrion is so paranoid, he actually switches up the maester that's caring for him. Maester loyalty is especially hard to determine, though. Are they loyal to the house they're from? Are they loyal to the house they serve? Or are they loyal to the Citadel? Cersei sends Maester Balabar of House Redwine to take care of Tyrion. Tyrion refuses Balabar and wants to be taken care of by Maester Franken, who serves House Stokeworth. Was Tyrion ever in danger? I don't know, probably not. So next we get this extra scene between Cersei and Tyrion, where she makes a nod to the book and says that she heard that Tyrion lost his nose. Now here in the show, Tyrion claims that his father hasn't visited him once while he's been in his sickbed. In the book, Tywin claims that he visited Tyrion all the time, and Tyrion has at least one memory of him. Yet Tyrion still feels neglected. This is an interesting aspect of Tyrion and Tywin's relationship in the book, Tywin is an absolute jerk, but Tyrion imagines even more jerky things. And Varys appears to be trying to create a rift between Tywin and Tyrion. Now next we have this extra scene where Bronn has words with Meryn Trant. In this scene, Sir Meryn claims that Bronn is not a knight. In the book, Sir Meryn spends an entire day knighting people after the Blackwater. He may have even knighted Bronn, but at minimum, he knows how cheap the title is right now. Now next we have this extra scene between Tyrion and Bronn where they discuss his salary. Here we find out that Bronn is no longer the head of the City Watch. Now in the book, Bronn was never head of the City Watch. 
Varys' crony Jocelyn Bywater was, but Bywater is killed by his own men at the Battle of the Blackwater. Now Littlefinger owns lots of people in the Gold Cloaks, so it's likely that Littlefinger had Bywater killed. Tywin makes a man named Adam Marbrand the new head of the Gold Cloaks. Now next we find Davos stranded on a rock in the middle of Blackwater Bay. His last memory is passing out underwater, so it's quite a mystery on how he ended up on this rock. Perhaps some underwater sea people exist? Another dead body washes up with him, so it's possible he used the other body as a life preserver. At this point, no one really knows. Now in both book and show, a ship arrives and asks him which king he serves. Davos says Stannis, and in the show it seems like it's good luck that the ship is for Stannis as well. Of course, Davos spent a life at sea, and in the book he recognizes that the ship is Lyseni. He knew to say Stannis. Now in our next scene, Davos gets to talk to his friend Salador San. Interestingly, in the book, Davos finds Salador cataloging one of Illyrio's ships. Salador claims that he seized this ship, but one also wonders if perhaps Salador took a bribe from Illyrio. In both book and show, Davos reveals to Salador that he plans on murdering Melisandre, and later Davos is arrested for this crime. Now this quite obviously implicates Salador as the informant, and this wouldn't be the first time that he ratted somebody out. In the book, Stannis' hand is Alistair Florent. Alistair tries to make a secret peace deal and wants to use Salador as a messenger. Salador San stabs him in the back, turns him in, and Alistair is burned alive. Now Davos does suspect his friend and is quite upset about it, but then Melisandre tells Davos that she found out about the plan through her flames. Davos completely believes her and goes back to trusting Salador San. Now next we get this extra scene with Rob and Roose Bolton arriving at Harrenhal. Now here in the show, Tywin had left Harrenhal to the mountain, and the mountain for some reason has abandoned it. In the book, Tywin gave it to Sir Amory Lorch, who lost it to the Brave Companions when they turned on him, and the Brave Companions led in Roose Bolton and the Northern Forces. Now, Harrenhal is without a doubt the most convoluted plot in the book, and it remains convoluted here in the show. Rob finds that the mountain has put everyone at Harrenhal to the sword. We are treated to this extra scene of Roose and Rickard Karstark talking about how 200 Northmen have been slaughtered. It's never explained why 200 Northmen would be in Harrenhal. 200 Rivermen, do they mean? Or are these captives? Catelyn finds a man from House Malister, who are of the Riverlands, but the man is in his armor, so I'm not sure if there was a battle or not. Did the mountain house his captives in their armor? And then out of nowhere, they find Kyburn. Now Kyburn is a disgraced maester, so he wouldn't be working for any particular house. In the book, Kyburn works for the Brave Companions as a healer, though he quite mysteriously wins over Roos Bolton and becomes his right-hand man. Kyburn starts leeching Roos and answering his raven mail. So Kyburn is a rather mysterious character. I theorize that he works for House Martell, but we'll talk more about that later on. Now in our next scene, Tyrion has gone to see his father, Tywin. Tywin is writing a letter, and if you read carefully, it's gibberish. And this is because this letter is being written in code. This scheming is the seeds of the Red Wedding. In the book, Rob was likely seduced by the Westerlings. And we know this because the Westerlings were rewarded rather than punished after the war. And of course, in both book and show, Rob's marriage alienates the Freys. This letter is likely to house Frey planning the Red Wedding. Now Tyrion is facing off with his father because he wants gratitude. Now in the book, Tywin does actually give Tyrion some gratitude in various ways, but Tyrion is blind to them. For instance, in the book, Tywin actually tells Tyrion that his chain was very clever and was essential to their win. Tywin orders that Bronn be knighted and be given a sigil of a burning chain. And when Mace Tyrell and Paxter Redwine arrive, they compliment Tyrion on his efforts. So Tywin and everyone else do recognize Tyrion's importance. However, Tywin also recognizes that the win was a team effort, with he and Cersei playing important roles. This assessment is, of course, true, but Tyrion insists on feeling slighted and escalates the conversation to that of Casterly Rock. Now keep in mind, under the laws of gods and men, Tyrion is the heir to Casterly Rock. Tywin cannot change that unless he gets Jaime to leave the Kingsguard. And Tyrion is not scheduled to get Casterly Rock as a possession until his father dies. Tywin is pretty healthy, so we're talking about an event that's going to happen in 20 to 30 years. But Tyrion, for some reason, at this moment, presses the issue and wants Tywin to admit that he's the heir. Tywin refuses, and then the conversation goes to prostitutes. Now it's pretty clear that Tywin was sleeping with Shay before Tyrion started sleeping with Shay. And this is the reason why Tywin didn't want Tyrion to bring Shay to King's Landing. Tywin has heard that Tyrion is still with a prostitute, and fears that this prostitute is Shay. In the book, he even tries to get Tyrion to name her. And Tyrion wonders, why do you care? Now next we get this extra scene with Sansa and Shay, where they're looking at ships in the bay. 
Littlefinger comes by and tells Sansa that he can get her out of King's Landing. Now throughout A Clash of Kings and Half of a Storm of Swords, it's Ser Dantos, Littlefinger's crony, that's been ensuring Sansa that he can spirit her away. One huge difference between the show and the book is that Littlefinger and Sansa never have a private conversation prior to her kidnapping. He says a couple creepy things to her in A Game of Thrones while people are around, and then steers clear of her for two books. This makes the reveal that Littlefinger was behind Sansa's kidnapping all the more shocking. Meanwhile, across the narrow sea, Danny is on her way to Slaver's Bay. Now in the book, three of Illyrio's cronies show up in Carth and want to take Daenerys back to Pentos. It's Jorah who suddenly doesn't want to go back to Pentos and tells Danny to go to Slaver's Bay and get an army. Now keep in mind, in A Game of Thrones, Jorah desperately wanted to take Daenerys to a shy so they could grab a boat back to Pentos. He then convinces Daenerys not to go to Ashai in A Clash of Kings, and now he's convincing Daenerys not to go to Pentos. It seems Jorah is now in love with Daenerys and wants to keep her safe away from Illyrio and whatever forces are in Ashai. Interestingly, in the book on this boat trip, Jorah also makes a move on Daenerys and tries to convince her that polygamy is the way. This gets into the reoccurring Kierkegaard theme of whether or not there can be love and marriage at the same time that we see in Ice and Fire. Keep in mind, Jorah had one functioning marriage without love, and a dysfunctional marriage with love. It's all very, very Kierkegaard. Jorah seems to immediately recognize that Daenerys needs marriage for alliances, and so he puts forward the proposal of polygamy. Now next we are treated to an extra scene in Stannis' chamber where Davos has arrived to see him. But Melisandre taunts Davos and he tries to kill her. Now in the book, Davos doesn't make it up to see Stannis. He makes it up to Dragonstone where he's made to wait, and wait some more, and wait some more. And then he's finally arrested. I imagine all of that waiting was because Salador Sand's men had come in another entrance and were warning them about Davos' plans. And next we're treated to an extra scene where Joffrey and Marjorie are heading through the city and Marjorie gets out in order to give charity to an orphanage. She gives toys and aid to these kids and Joffrey takes note. And later on, Joffrey, Marjorie, Cersei, and Loras have dinner and everyone talks about the charity. And Cersei clearly sees it as scheming. Now Marjorie doesn't do this in the book, but we do hear about the Tyrells going around the city with baskets of food and giving it away in Marjorie's name. Now next, Daenerys makes it to Astapor, and we have a series of scenes that are actually very similar to the book. She meets the Unsullied and gets to hear about their tortures, right down to their nipple slicings. The big difference is the character of Missandei. In the book, Missandei is presented as a small child. We aren't actually sure if she is a small child. It seems doubtful. She knows way too many languages and is quite intelligent. Now, as in the book, we actually hear that there's another potential buyer for the Unsullied. He is known as the Corsair King. In the book, we actually find that Slaver's Bay is quite crowded with mysterious characters at this point. Besides the Corsair King, we know that Euron Greyjoy, Theon's uncle, is also in the bay with the warlocks watching Daenerys. And so a lot of fans wonder if a few of these characters are actually the same people. Is Euron the Corsair King? Is Euron Dario? Is Dario the Corsair King? Do they know each other? Do they work for each other? We simply don't know. Now next Daenerys is presented a ball by a small girl and, oh no, there's a manticore inside, but phew, she's saved by Barristan Selmy. In the book, this scene actually happens back in Karth. Daenerys is presented a box from a sorrowful man. Sorrowful men are like assassins who always say I'm sorry before they kill somebody. And Daenerys thinks this sorrowful man has been hired by Pyat Pri, the warlock though we don't know how she finds out this information. Barristan Selmy saves her life, but he's actually in disguise at this point as Arston Whitebeard. Whitebeard is one of three Illyrio cronies that come to Danny and Karth. The other two are Strong Belwas and Grolio, the ship captain. And that's all for episode 3.1. See you in episode 3.2.